Yeah, man. Uh, Michael, welcome to the podcast. Welcome to the YouTube Live, whatever we call it nowadays. I appreciate you taking the time to come on, man. I know you're a busy guy. Um, and yeah, man, I appreciate you taking the time. You do a lot of great things for the football and community. I know everyone who sees your stuff. I mean, it's top quality, top class, done well, with no. tons of detail. So uh, yeah, if you could just you know introduce yourself for the people who don't who don't know you, uh, I'm excited to dive into this conversation, man. Thanks, man. Firstly, Rick, thanks for having me on, man. I know it's it's long overdue. I've I've seen your sure, stuff as sure. well, man. Been been a big supporter of what you're doing. I know you're very sure. educated in the industry and helping out a lot of people reach their goals. So appreciate that, man. But yeah, so I'm Michael Cunningham. Uh, grew up in in the UK. Currently out in the USA playing in the USL with FC Tulsa. Um, definitely not a traditional journey to get here, but. My goals with YouTube is just to kind of a little bit of showing my journey, but a lot of it is kind of showing how I trained kind of through the years, the individual work that I've put in, which has kind of helped me reach higher levels and just kind of sharing different ways that those, for those players who don't necessarily have access to coaches or teams, that they can still get a lot of work in by themselves to prepare them for those opportunities so they're a little better equipped so i guess that's my main my main goal with all of my online stuff mm -hmm. no. so just your your journey through the ranks of uh you know how you got over to the states your football in england just a little bit of background and then we can dive into some stuff stuff from there yeah for sure so obviously in england you just grew up kicking the ball around even if you're not in a club to begin with it's just kind of a part of our culture so always grew up playing, uh, was never really that passionate about playing on a team, to be honest, until hmm. maybe 11, 12 years old. I was, I was pretty interested in other things. I really liked uh, martial arts, uh, did a little hmm. gymnastics for a while, a lot of random stuff, but I really was more into individual sports. At a younger age, I played a bit of tennis as hmm. well. And um, I really liked sports individually because it kind of showed progression. I was always big on progressing and always looking back and being able to see certain mm -hmm. things in my life that have progressed. I think that was it just yes. helped me map out, um, making sure, making me feel like I was on a track to to something towards something. They're always working towards something has kind of yes. been a big motivator for me. And yeah, so it wasn't really until my secondary school years that I was playing a lot with a lot of my mates just at school. They convinced me to come and join their team. I probably wouldn't have done it if it wasn't a bunch of my mates. Didn't even know the offside rule, honestly, until I was probably 12 or 13. So uh -huh. I, w I was athletic. I was decent with the ball just through playing with it a lot every day, but only started to take it really seriously, probably deep into my teenagers, maybe even 14 or 15, once I got a good con mm. concept of tactics. Um, played a lot of Sunday league, youth football, um, jumped into men's league at the age of 16. There was a club near me, Kegworth Imps, that mm -hmm. I just jumped on. And that was kind of a wake up call for me to the physical side of the game. Knew yes. I needed to put on a little bit of timber. I was fast, but I was very slight growing up. I even uh -huh. tried to play rugby at one point. And that mm -hmm. first training session I had, I just got absolutely destroyed by yeah. bigger boys. So. I knew I had to put on a little bit of weight, take care of my mm. nutrition a little bit more. And so I joined a academy in college. So in college in England, it's from 16 to 18. It's almost mm -hmm. like a trade school. You can either go do your A-levels, which is your last two years of high school, or you can go away to college. And mm -hmm. I wanted to do something specific. I was really passionate about sports. So I wanted mm. to study like the sports science. And it just so happened the college that I applied to had a football academy run by an ex-professional player his name was steve wilkinson he played for preston a couple of other mm -hmm. teams he was a striker so that was a great place to develop it was the first time i'd experienced training every day with other players in an environment where you're having to make a lot of decisions so as mm -hmm. someone who kind of got into the game late i developed very quickly because sort of my my plateau was quite far away because i hadn't Mm -hmm. had that experience before so for sure I started to see a lot of growth i was very hungry and i think something that maybe did help me get into the game later i didn't burn out quickly because it was all new to me yes. and i was so hungry so keen to learn i didn't think i knew anything so mm. i didn't get complacent 
really poured into those couple of years at college and then tried to expand my experience a little bit more. So I played a lot of semi-professional football in non-league. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, there was a guy on my academy team whose dad was an ex Nottingham Forest player. He he managed a semi-professional team. My buddy Dan Starbuck played for the team. So I joined mm -hmm. the team, um, got a couple of minutes here and there, but that was a good experience to play with guys who have been at a, a decent level. So how old were you when you joined that team? So when I joined the semi-professional team, I would have been 17. So it was, mm -hmm. it was at early into the second year of my college academy. So I ended up doing three years at the academy overall. Um, into my third year into the college academy, so I would have been 18 going on 19. I ended up being a part of this competition that Nike was running at the time. Uh, it was called the Nike Chance, and they were yeah, yeah, yeah. they were developing something called the Nike Academy. So at the, we mm -hmm. all know what it is now, but at the time yeah. it was it was brand new. But it just uh -huh. so happened that the university uh, next to the college that I was at, that's where their training center was going to be. So I ended up managed to get a contact there, ended up going for a trial, and ended up staying there for about a month where they were basically trying to build like a showcase team all wearing mm -hmm. Nike products. And they were trying mm -hmm. to build it to be something that hopefully would get players signed to professional teams in the future. First mm -hmm. year I was there, it was only English players as far as I remember. There might have been a couple of internationals, but at least if they were internationals, they'd been living in England for a while. So mm -hmm. it wasn't big mm -hmm. at the time. Uh, I stayed there for a month and then ended up getting a trial at a team called Luton Town, which had mm -hmm. just been kicked out of League Two. They were looking for, mm -hmm. for players to come in because they were trying to rebuild a little bit. So I went in with they're the League Two under right now, aren't they? Yeah. So the League Two yeah. now, at the time, they went into administration. So it was a lot of financial uh -huh. issues. Mm -hmm. And um, they went into what was called the Blue Square Premier League at the time. I think it's I think it's the National League now. Okay. I think that's what they call it. Mm -hmm. um, so I went in with the under 18s, which was a, a really good experience. Obviously, getting some mm -hmm. very high, highly qualified coaches looking at me the whole time. Um, in there for a little bit, but just through money struggles, and and they weren't a fully professional team at the time. They weren't able to keep players on and pay for their housing as they had been able to do previously. So. That was a short mm -hmm. stint and I was kind of left looking for the next opportunity. So then it was basically decision time whether I wanted to go to university or continue playing. And obviously, mm -hmm. like I said, I was still very early into my development. I was so keen on playing. I just absolutely mm -hmm. fell in love with football and the development mm -hmm. side of things. For so sure. the university athletics in England aren't anywhere near the level in the US. You know, they don't mm -hmm. have the facilities, the competitive level isn't anywhere near as high so i started looking into opportunities in the us and mm. i didn't have a agency or anything i didn't really know how to go about it so all i did was just took a highlight video that i had i went on google started looking up different universities mm -hmm. and finding the like the uh, athletic director's email on the the roster for the athletics page and then just absolutely spamming hundreds of colleges yeah. around the yeah. us uh -huh. and Got, got a lot of responses, a lot of sort of offers that I wouldn't have been able to to pursue financially just because of how expensive school is out here. And mm -hmm. I, I found it a lot of the coaches were a bit hesitant to take a chance on me just because they'd not seen me play in person. A lot of, a mm -hmm. lot of players get recruited through ID camps out here in the US. At least they've been watching them for a while. Sure. And So where, where so, did those highlights come from? So was some it? Sunday League. There was some at okay. the... Uh, at Loughborough College Academy. My dad mm -hmm. filmed a bunch of games, me playing mm -hmm. just for my youth teams and stuff like that. So it you was grind. a collection of highlights. Yeah, oh yeah, it was yeah, on yeah, like, yeah. I remember he had yeah. one of these cameras that you still had to put yeah, like the, yeah. the VHS tape into. Yeah. He would he would and zoom in. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The, and the, the zoom the made like this size. noise. Yeah. 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 When, when it would yeah. zoom in, it'd be like, Zzzz, sound like C3PO yeah, yeah, yeah. or something. It was crazy, uh -huh. but yeah, so I have, I have probably maybe a four, four minute video and then i replayed a couple of the clips put them in slow-mo a couple of times to stretch it out to about seven minutes yeah, yeah, yeah. and what um, position were you playing i was playing right wing for most of it okay yeah maybe a couple of bit in the in the academy at loughborough i was doing a little bit of center mid very mm. like old school english center mid but mm. um i was a very old school right winger as well you know just kind of running up and down the line whipping mm. in crosses mm. so right footed right wing um 
And, you know, I got, I got some responses, but I made a big mistake at first because mm -hmm. they would ask me, you know, have you ever been sponsored? Have you ever been paid? So I thought like them asking me that if I said yes, that makes me look good. So I was like, yeah, I was in the yeah. Nike Academy. We got sponsored. Yeah, yeah I got paid for the semi-professional team. Yeah, yeah, and they were like, oh, well, you're not eligible to play. So I basically mm. shot myself in the foot. I couldn't get in on any NCAA schools my first year. But I looked mm. into something called the NAIA, which was a mm. college system a little bit more flexible. Older players were coming in and players who have had decent experiences been previously paid. They were able mm. to get some college playing experience. So it just so happened uh -huh. the, the school I ended up going to, their my first year there, they were NAIA. And then they ended up making the switch to NCAA Division II my sophomore year. And mm. the NCAA only take your previous 12 months. That's what they look at. So I was nice. then eligible to play because I'd been in college. You know, I hadn't been paid mm. or sponsored or anything like that. Mm. So it worked out and ended up going to an, an OK conference. Um, some top five teams in our in our conference, like LA, uh, LIU, Long Island University, mm -hmm. LIU Post. And then we had... Um, mm -hmm. NYIT, who were very good. So that was great. And obviously, that was like a dream for me, getting to train every day sure. at amazing facilities, sure. traveling with the team. That mm. was like the a really good representation of what I, I thought the professional ranks would be mm. like. And a lot more professional than any team I'd been involved with in England. Like even at like for a sure. League Two team doesn't for compete sure. with uh, at least the professional standards of college. Um, mm. So like just to touch on that, how did – couple questions so like you were talking about you, you didn't really get into you know team football uh until you know 15 15 16 were you playing like a lot of were you playing a lot of small sided with your with your boys and, and doing oh, a lot yeah. of individual work yeah um, oh yeah every every single day you know um at our school we had like tennis courts where we'd play a lot of 5v5 3v3 uh mm -hmm. after school we'd go down and we'd have one one goal post and we play a lot of like world cup I'm sure you played mm -hmm. it you know yeah, where yeah, like course, you're either course. individual with with a with a partner and it's one goal Nothing like it knock it off yeah, hours yeah. hours and then <laughs> yeah. um but yeah just i didn't even i didn't even like really think about playing on a team because i think how mm. football is in england it's it's just a part of the culture and even if you're exactly. not on a team you you are playing some somehow every day exactly. i think obviously my my tactical development maybe took a took a bit of a hit for it not being in a team mm. environment early on because I remember my my primary school uh, the football coach there was always saying like Michael we want you to come play come play yeah. and it wasn't until years later I saw him again when I was finally like playing and he was just, like spent years trying to get you to play and now you're like really keen on what's going on yeah. but the funny thing is a lot of the guys who were playing on the teams earlier on were, were no longer playing because I think mm. sometimes you know if 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 you're not, if you don't feel like you're going anywhere with it in the UK, you, you you do stop and then maybe just play Sunday league where you're training once a week, sometimes no times a week, and then just mm. playing on a weekend kind of thing. So mm. I, I'm not, I don't regret it. I think maybe I would be tactically a bit more astute as a player now if I'd kind of got. I, I think you get a lot of muscle memory developed when you're when you're really young. So yes. at least I was getting touches on the ball, but I think my understanding of the game. I've I've had to study it a little bit more, and um, sure. it doesn't come quite as naturally as maybe some other players who have spent so many years mm -hmm. in a team environment being coached. I kind of just mm -hmm. had to figure a lot of it out by myself. What and just watching like highlight videos and things like that, which aren't always a representation of the game. You know, yes. you're watching like a mm -hmm. five minute Ronaldinho clip, and you're thinking every time you get <laughs> yeah. the ball, you need to do an elastic. A little bit of and... Benito. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Yeah. No, yeah. no, that's very interesting because it's, you know, it's a very interesting journey and it's, you know, it's something similar that I experienced that I see as well now for myself, like, you know, just, you know, 27 now, like really like studying the game with like good coaches. Like I didn't really have good coaches growing up. And like you said, like, I'm not where I want to be tactically. Obviously you could always improve. And I think you said it from the beginning, I think, you know, everything at, at the next level is decision making like the right decisions with quality with um you know consistency and i think you know it's a combination of everything and, and that's why football is such a it's so interesting you know there's there's so many aspects you know you got the tactical aspect you got to have the right spacing the right positioning then you yeah. know 
what you lo- what you you're all about the ball mastery, which I love as well. The ball mastery, all that technique stuff's unbelievable. And then the football fitness. So it's like all those three, and then obviously that mindset part. So it's like I think there are so many people that want to put these things in buckets, but it's like I think it's 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 you know trying to combine them all properly and then align them uh, you know with your position, your strengths, um, and and you know it's it's interesting because. Also, what I took from what you said in the beginning, you know, if personally, I'm a big guy, like I, I love movement. I love like watching movement and, and things like that. And you can see like, you, you know, you're a tall guy, you know, got a good frame, but you move really well. So I wonder if that martial arts helped you with that. Do you think martial arts at a young age helped you with movement? Because I, I, I do see that. And, you know, I mean, look, look at Zlatan, you know? Yeah. And um, to tell you a secret. Um, I was, my mum actually got me into Irish dancing, believe it or not, when I was, when I was about six and seven years old, we had like a little village hall and it's kind of like a version of, uh, oh, what do they call it? Like not tap dancing, but, um, river dance. Have you ever seen Uh river dance? If you, if you haven't, but it's a lot of, it's a lot of footwork. It's all, it's the whole dance with the feet. You basically keep your upper body straight arms by your side and it's all wow. footwork and i loved it i, mean, ah, I, I only... could see it now yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> i was the okay. only guy in the room i only lasted yeah. one year because i started to realize okay maybe there's a reason like no other lads are in here but um <laughs> but I, I really enjoyed it and martial arts for sure i was i was obsessed with it i watched all the bruce lee movies i love jackie mm. chan movies and i just love the way they use their body the balance the strength yes. to be able to like hold your leg in the air. Mm-hmm. When I when I first tried it out, I was just like, oh my, this is um, like the core strength you need for it all. Yeah. But it's it's all it's all footwork. It's pattern you're being graded, and I I absolutely loved it. Me and one my one of my friends, we entered in as like white belts, but we stayed all the mm-hmm. way until I think we did Tetsudo, which is it's a lot of kicks, it's a lot of blocks. Yeah, it's less about assault. It's more about defending and but yes. it's, it's all about positioning keeping your body strong in ways to to have a good trunk and mm. I, th- I think you're, you're probably right i think it did help me with coordinating my body early on i wasn't mm. to be honest i didn't have a growth spurt until later on either i was i wasn't sure i was probably just below average but i had a growth spurt later on but i do think my my earlier experiences with maybe martial arts and just playing with the ball a lot are still very coordinated, good balance. Mm. And I think that probably kept me in, in good standing because I didn't really mm. give up e- even tennis, to be honest. Tennis is a lot of footwork, oh, it's a lot of la- lateral oh, yeah. side to side. You're having to keep your balance because you, you're you always reacting, you know. So I think a lot of those things probably all tied together in the end and help me be sure. become a better athlete. I don't it's interesting to to think about if I just picked up mm. football early on and that would be it, what kind of my style would be like now, if it would be any different. Mm-hmm. That's mm-hmm. it's one of those things that drive you mad pondering, but for sure. No, because it's yeah. it's actually it's it's something that I've I've been really interested in, like, you know, ever since I really got into studying movement in the body and, and I always like you see South Americans move like, uh, you know, you know how they move and they're so fluid, you know, and, and, and yeah. they're so good. They're so good. Like you talked about moving, moving your body, moving their body in space, controlling their body, controlling their hips. And if you think about it, where does it all come from? It comes from their culture, you know, like like football in, 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 in England and parts of Europe and also South America. But it's a dance culture. They're always mm-hmm. happy. They're always having, you know, smile and good vibes. And, and that's part of it as well. Um, so you look at these guys movement. I mean, look, look at Aguero, these guys, how, how low they are to the ground, obviously messy. Um, and, and, you know, just how free they are. Neymar, Ronaldinho, they're free on the ball. They're not stiff like other guys that we see, um, other Europeans. Um, and it's something that, you know, personally for me, like, you know, coming from my background, I was a bit, you know, more into the gym work, you know, and I'm still all about the gym work, but incorporating like fluidity, mobility stuff gets you more to move more like that. And secret as well, like I, uh, after my surgery, I had like a a couple months ago, 
I, you know, my biggest thing was my hips. So like I started doing dancing myself, man. Like, but yeah. it was one-on-one, on, one on one. like I said, like <laughs> I told my physical therapist, I was like, yo, like you got to get me like a dance teacher, but one-on-one, -on -one. I'm not a dancer. Oh, that's awesome. Man, it helped, helped me a lot. Like yeah. I would go to once or twice a week and man, like my hips just, you know, like taught me a lot of stuff, like moving the hips and in and, and coordination with the body. And it's just, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting to, um, see those aspects and then how, how everything ties into, into football. Yeah, no, you're spot on. And I noticed that even in our FC Tulsa here, we do have a lot of, um, people from South America. We have players from Africa and I've noticed both of those. They're the, they're the guys dancing in the locker room before, you know, it's always just a part of their, and it, you, you see it out on the field. There's just like a flamboyancy with them, the way they move, they, the way they shimmy and it makes everything so much more effective. It's, it's mm -hmm. that their style is added to every movement. Like we can mm -hmm. teach someone else a body faint and they'll replicate exactly how we do it, but they take the body faint and they, they're like flicking yeah. their shoulders and like their hips. Yeah, exactly. and yeah. It is. It it does resemble dancing a lot of the time. It's it's fun to watch, not fun to defend against. But oh yeah, yeah it's, it's sure, great. Man. Yeah, it's funny though because most British people, you probably think, uh, well, we are. We're quite a stiff culture, not very uh, expressive. Um, if you ever went to a club in England, the the dance floor, it's mainly you know arms, big fish, little fish. It's like <laughs> the guys aren't moving. Like there's no salsa or anything like that. Yeah. And, and typically, I mean, we've got some exceptions now, a lot of talented players coming through, but at least old school footballers in England, is it's quite a stiff, stiff style. I mean, very technical, like pinging mm. balls, good defending in that, but you didn't, you never really see a lot of um, flair. And I would say it's sure. probably discouraged, maybe not so much now, but at least when I was growing up, if you ever played Sunday League, even throwing a step over, you're just like, mm. you, automatically you're a Ronaldo wannabe or... You, you never wear bright boots. You, you should be wearing yeah. Copa Mundials only and it's and it's playing two touch. And that's all you can do mm. without mm. getting some kind of hate. Mm -hmm. And if you do any kind of moves, you're getting absolutely crunched five minutes later. For so sure. interesting, man. Different cultures. Yeah, no, I'm, and I'm not saying I'm not saying one style is better than the other. Like I think no, it's no, like all. All about, all, all about like intertwining, you know, and like finding finding your own style. You know, I yeah. I always like to say that every every single person has their own movement pattern, you know, and uh, you got to find what works for you and then and, and all about like developing, you know, going towards your strengths. But yeah, man, uh, after so like through, through your college years, how, how'd that kind of go? You know, how how'd it work out? Um, yeah, it, it, was, it was good. Great experience. Um, the team I was on, we, we had some talent. It was a lot of local guys. Our, it was a small division two. Well, it originally an NAIA school, then went to division two, but their, their scope of recruitment, it was very rare that they would get international. There was, there was always like one or two of us, but I was like the only English guy at my entire school, my first year, at least our tennis teams were very international, but it seemed like our, our football team, a lot of local guys, you know, mm. upstate New Yorkers, I mean, but we we had a, a lot of talent as well. My first year we came in very good. Um, we went to the NAI tournament that year. We got knocked out by Lindsey Wilson, which is a very good team. I think mm, our, yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember our team, we got three red cards that game for guys fighting amongst themselves. And it was just like a shambles in the end. But mm. our first year in Division Two, we couldn't go to the post tournament which was a shame because we had a very good year because that was our transition year going into D2. So you could compete, but you couldn't go to the nationals after. Mm -hmm. And that's probably the only year we would have gone to nationals, at least in my time there, because we had a pretty good year. The second year, my my junior year, I had a very bad year for injuries. And you know, you know yourself how short US college seasons are, three months and you're done. Yeah. I had a hip flexor injury, which kept me out for uh, about 12 weeks. Mm. So by the end of it, I, I think I managed to scrape in. So I got her first day of preseason because I was training so much over that summer trying to get fit, but I kind of overdid it and mm. wasn't taking care of my nutrition. I was just kind of obsessed, but not in a healthy way. Lost a lot of weight. I think my body percentage, body fat percentage was down to like six and a half percent. It was crazy. And then just picked up a yeah. hip flexor injury first day of preseason. And I think I managed to play the last four games maybe 
had okay, mm. and, like scored a couple of goals, got back to fitness, but then the season was over. Then mm-hmm. my the summer between my junior year and senior year, I went and played PDL. So I went and played mm-hmm. out in Southern California. Uh, mm-hmm. It's a very competitive conference out there. They had like the San Jose Earthquakes, under 23s are out there. Mm-hmm. Um, very competitive. The style of football out there is very, it's got a very South American flair to it because mm-hmm. a lot of South Americans are there and they play mm-hmm. football year round because of the weather. So very competitive. And then I came back my senior year and it was almost like, I kind of compare it. If you ever played FIFA on um, like world-class mode, then you switched it back to like semi-pro or something like that. <laughs> like, wow, it's so easy now. That's kind of yeah. what it felt like because it was a lot faster and pace out there. The intensity was a lot higher. And even though college athletics very intense, I've, I felt like it was a little bit of a step down. So mm-hmm. I, um, I felt a lot more comfortable. Felt like the game slowed down a lot for me. I could make decisions. Had a good year individually. I was All-American that year, All-Conference. Mm. We went awesome. to... So we also competed in a the NCCAA, which is the National Christian Collegiate Athletics Association. So they mm-hmm. have their own national tournament if your team finishes above 500 so if you win as many or more games and you lose you get to go to the tournament so we went down there we we went to the national tournament um did okay we ended up i think we won no we tied we had two group games we tied against the top team in the in the tournament and then we lost our next game against like the third team in the nation so you know it was a good way to go out i felt like it was a good experience overall I got to go to the convention, the National Coaches Convention, because when you get the All-American Award, that's where you go to get your certificate. And actually, Sir Alex Ferguson was the guy giving out the certificates. He was like the guest of honor, which was unbelievable. So he was up there giving some speeches, and he basically spoke about Ronaldo the whole time, because I think, especially here in the US, they can relate to that work ethic that Ronaldo is so famous for. And he had so many stories where he's like, he would show up to the training ground at like six in the morning thinking he was the first mm-hmm. one there. And he would get there, the door's already open, but there's no other staff there. And he walks in, Ronaldo's in the gym, like 30 mm-hmm. minutes before him. Then he's like the last yeah, yeah, yeah. to leave every day. He said he would like, at the end of training, the training complex was about three miles, he said, like the per- perimeter of it. Ronaldo would slap on ankle weights and just jog around the perimeter with the ball just doing step overs pop, 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 and then like dribble a little bit pop, 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 and like just every every day just working and that's why his leg speed is so insanely quick now just because the consistency he put into his training was on another level he just said mm-hmm. there wasn't a day there was no there was no day where Ronaldo wasn't feeling it well at least he didn't mm-hmm. show it you know he, he just mm-hmm. always made the decision to give his best and he said his first year at United he spent like 70 percent of his contract on like personal chefs to live with him in his home like massage therapists basically invested his whole paycheck into himself you know because he was like he's like either i spend this money now on cars and everything like that or i invest myself now and i'll never ever need to worry Mm -hmm. about money for the rest i mean it paid off for him now so (laughs) fair play for sure no i mean at the end of the day man you are your 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 best investment you know yeah. and especially you know investing into your body investing into your mind that always pays back it's 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 like the best stock in the world um yeah that's perfect but yeah something that that you said that that's interesting that you know i think like that balance of like doing the right amount of work um and, and staying as fit as possible, staying injury free is, is such a tough thing. You know, I mean, you mentioned junior year, you got injured. Um, I've, I've gotten injured because of overworking. Um, and I think nowadays, which, you know, I'm all like, I'm all about, we're both all about the social media and promoting good, a good work rate, uh, working hard. Um, is there any way that you recommend like youngsters because you know obviously with the tndo mentality take no days off we have you know i I get a lot of messages i'm sure you do oh you know rick i wake up at 5 a.m um i do this this and this i'm exhausted in my game um and for me like i i try to always go to the recovery route first of all and then second of all i always try to go to the football is a quad like it's it's a 
all about quality. You know, like guys want to compare themselves to Kobe, even Ronaldo. And, and unfortunately, from the scientific standpoint, genetically some guys are just different like you just yeah. gotta accept the recovery standpoint that recovery like just muscle fibers are just different so like i said from the beginning with the with the incorporating your style from a you know dance perspective and, and finding your style english english wise as a you know whatever style like finding your own i think you also have to find what works for, for you in terms of the you know the work to rest uh ratio so you don't get injured because what I really have seen is like, there's just personally for me. And I try to pass this along to youngsters is the most important thing is that they're on the field playing the game, you know, and um, I'm all about uh, individual work and, and, and uh, you know, off field work. But uh, you know, I think trying to, you know, balance that in a smart way is, is the right move. But I mean, obviously there's, yeah, there's scientific methods, but there's no, some people don't have the, the means to pay for things. Are there any recommendation that you would give so that people can incorporate proper work so they don't get injured, but they get better? Yeah, I know the, the, the cliche saying is listen, listen to your own body, right? So yeah, exactly, but exactly. honestly, I, sometimes I found my body is not telling me the right, the right thing. And, um, I, I think this year has been frustrating in a way. I've, I've had some injuries that has, has kept me off the field a lot this season. But most of these injuries have been sort of contact injuries, you know, where it's pretty unavoidable. You take a kick. But the most frustrating ones is the ones you were talking about is the, the overuse injuries, where it usually comes when you're so mentally focused and you're so passionate you're so driven and you're pushing your body to those extremes because you're like i want to improve i want to and then and then something something snaps right something something gives way because there's a weakness in the body of some sort so for me definitely over the last three years maybe this is something you you have to do once you get older but if i could go back i would i would have done prehab from the very beginning yes. activation i think activation for me is the key because when you're training in the morning not everything is activated you can warm up you can jog back and forth but not everything is activated those really small muscle fibers that you, your body is so com complex and not everything switches on right away yeah. your, your body wants to be as efficient as possible your body wants to use as least energy as it possibly can to preserve because it's your body doesn't care that you're a footballer, honestly. It just wants to go about your day surviving, using the least amount of energy so that you can store the most amount of energy. So you kind of have to you have to trick it almost and, and like do the extra thing. So working with resistance bands is huge, you know, targeting yes. the glutes, targeting the hip flexors, targeting the groins. Because if you don't do these things, your one other part of your body is going to take that load. You still might feel like you're running at the same pace or just as intense, but that just means like one part of your body is taking more load instead of it being a balance between two and all. So the two things that I picked up the last couple of years that I would have never thought about before is yoga and activation. So a lot of resistance band work, a, a lot of, I, I, I don't do like prolonged stretching before my sessions, but at least enough to like, feel like i'm mobile i think mobility is the key it's not so much about being crazy flexible but mobility in the joints is where is where if you don't take care of those i think that's where the the injuries come because if you're not moving as freely and both sides of the body like i said one part somewhere's going to overcompensate because your body just mm -hmm. wants to be efficient and mm -hmm. it's usually the the straw that breaks the camel's back when it comes to these kind of injuries you don't realize it until it's too late you don't really get a lot of warning signs to say like okay you might get a little bit of tightness here and there yeah. but you don't get a lot of warning signs because the body is so clever at making you feel good using another part of the body to sort of pick up the slap for another part so mm -hmm. for me doing a lot of mobility work daily even if it's just a little i, I would recommend athletes to just do like rather than trying to do a 30 minute session because a lot of people when they take that on you can't maintain that when it's a new part of your schedule just do five so, minutes every day everybody's got five minutes in the morning just a little something and i think if you did five minutes every day it's going to 
do a lot more service to you than maybe once a week of 30 exactly. minutes to an hour because you can have those days where you're like oh i really i'm really up for it i really want to do it and yeah, exactly. you'll crush 30 minutes of mobility but on those off days you're not going to want to do you're not going to want to do 30 minutes of mobility if you're just not feeling it but if you're in one of those days where you're low motivation you've still got five minutes and you can get through five minutes i think so mm. take consistency over quantity i think like the, the old quality over quantity saying mm -hmm. you know so yeah i in terms of a actual formula that's really athlete to athlete you know this yourself but i yeah i, th I think mobility and activation have been game changers mm -hmm. for me for sure mm -hmm. um and i wish i i wish i took on that in my younger years where even when i didn't need it because like i said your body is very good at tricking you into thinking you don't need it it's it's sure. good and when you're young you just don't feel you don't feel the aches and pains as much you know absolutely absolutely uh, no and, and that's that's what athletes are man they're the you know athletes, like you said like you know if something's lagging the other another part of the body picks up for that slack and then that's when you know the over overuse injuries start to add up and that's so well said man because i try to preach that all the time and the, the the real the reality is you know warming up and 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 activation and stretching doesn't get a lot of likes on Instagram or YouTube. <laughs> no, no, no. But it's but it's yeah. but it's 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 the right you know. It's it's the cliche saying like you know, if you compare the body to a car, um, and it's a snowy cold day, yeah. you know, are you going to instantly turn that car on and 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 you know back out of your driver? Are you going to let it warm up a little bit? You know, and I I think. Like you said, and, and I want to also add in like a proper dynamic warm up before sessions. I know you do it all the time. I do it all the time. I know Matt does it himself all the time. Guys who are preaching it online. Um, but I, I still see that some, you know, some guys and girls, they don't do it. And then they tell me they get injured. So I think trying to get at least, like you said, even a five minute dynamic warm up, get in on the, on the tight areas and, and really, you know, get that range of motion going at the end of the day. If you, this is the way I try to look at it. If you get a proper 10 minute dynamic warm up in and you have, you only have an hour, I would rather you get a proper 10 to 15 minute dynamic warm up in, get a 45 to 50 minute quality session because you're well warm, you're well activated, like you said, rather than a 60 minute session at a medium intensity. Yeah. So you're well warm and you're, you're out there to get better. I mean, you know, we do individual sessions because we want to get better. Mm -hmm. And if you're well warm and well activated, you're going to be performing better, which is going to cause adaptation. So we're out there for adaptation. So why don't you put that extra 10 to 15 minute and minutes in and in the long run, it'll make you more mobile. And, and like you said, it'll make your body more efficient. Um, and, and cause like you said, the whole body, it's one chain, you know? Yeah. You hit so, the nail on the head there. Cause that, I think I'm going to go as far to say, 99% of footballers think a warm up is just to prevent injury so that they think oh no I'm feeling good I don't need to warm up but a lot of them don't realize that you you get so much more out of your session and performance by warming up if your if your muscle fibers are more elastic they're more explosive you're going to attack each drill with such higher intensity and yeah. like you said the body's going to adapt to that and you could spend 30 minutes out there after a warm up and get way more out of your session than spending an hour and a half out there with no warm up and just kind of going mm -hmm. through the motions going at about 80% of your maximum because you're just going to get very good at going at 80% and you're just going to get in a comfort zone with it and i also preach that same method for technical stuff too like if i'm going into a shooting drill and my goal of that session is to get shots from outside the box and eventually you know try and hit the corners and whatnot I'll start close to the goal. I'll start really close to the goal, just getting that clean contact on the ball, just lacing it into the corners, and then and then start to add a little bit more power, and then slowly but surely start to back it up a bit. Because if you go out there and your first shot shanked over the bar, second shot shanked past the post, there's a confidence with that, and you start to get when you're when you're not focused, you're not as disciplined with your technique, and you're going to find yourself just getting worse and worse and worse throughout the session. But if you kind of warm up into it, you actually get a lot more out of your shooting sessions because you're more focused. So 
rather than just spending two hours just like relentlessly hitting balls outside the box like okay eventually i'm gonna hit a good one mm-hmm. maybe it's better just to get like say all right okay, i'm just doing 30 shots today i'm gonna start the first 10 in here the first like around the penalty spot the second 10 are going to be at the 18 yard line then i'm going to progress mm-hmm. to the edge of the box because you'll start to get consistency with your technique yes. and you'll you'll maintain that through your session as well so i think there's easing into something and warming up has so many more benefits than just um mm. preventing injury or, or things like that there's, there's a there's a confidence with it there's learning your body in, in your warm-ups you can you can actually discover parts of your body that are a little bit tighter than others like okay i, I I'm doing high kicks from my right and I'm going head height and this leg doesn't want to go above chest. So like you discover a lot. Mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. Um, yeah, there's, I think there's just endless benefits that go way beyond just preventing injuries that mm. people don't appreciate as much. And the minute I, I started thinking of the warm up is a part of my session that is going to make me a better player. I, I don't think I've ever gone to a session without doing a dynamic warm up now. No chance. Mm-hmm. No, and there, there's two excellent things I want to touch on. I mean, the first thing is, like you, you talked about before with mobility. Like, people say they don't have time uh, or sometimes they don't have motivation. And and at the end of the day, mo- you know, sitting around and looking for motivation isn't going to give you motivation. Starting and doing something is going to get motivation. So like you said, all right, put it on your habits to-do list, five minutes of mobility today. Boom, you get in, you're doing you're already doing three minutes. Wow, I'm feeling good, you know? Then you end up doing 10 minutes, 15 minutes. And it's the same thing w- with training. You know, I some people say, you know, they don't feel motivated to train. And and you know, some days it's okay not to feel motivated. Maybe you didn't sleep well, maybe you didn't eat well the day before, maybe you're not well hydrated. So maybe it's best to do a little recovery day. But I always say, go out there, do a five-minute warm-up, at least a five-minute warm-up. If you're still feeling like crap, Take it easy on the day. But most of them, I would say 80, 90% of the time, you're going to start to feel good. The body gets warm and boom. What What is that? I like to think of all this stuff in so, such simple terms, like you said from the beginning, consistency. So if you go out more times and you do that warm up more times, you're going to train more times and it, it just rolls over and just keeps getting, keeps getting better. And like you said, you know, like I always say as well, consistency over intensity yeah it's those details and and honestly i think if people realized like if you offered said do you want to do a warm-up and they say no then you you can basically show them examples of people like ronaldo it's like because of those details and taking that little bit of extra time maybe adding 10 minutes onto your training session you might extend your playing career by four or five more years i mean it's it's a no-brainer when you think of it that way. It's it's that. it's an easy trade. It's just like it's a little bit of your time up front for maybe a huge extension of even just feeling healthy. Honestly, like you see a lot of guys at your age, Rick, like they just would not be able to do the things you're doing. You know, they wouldn't be able to perform. Like I'm I'm 30 years old now. You know, I'm not I'm not I'm not a young player at all. I'm I know a lot of 30 year olds that are moving a lot less freely than i am and i know they used to be athletes and whatnot but they didn't bother with their the small details they they've never done a yoga session in their life they eat pizza five times a week you know it's 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 these little things and i i think you just got to understand where what your goals are do you want to play for as long as possible at the highest level you possibly can or yeah i guess i guess and that's what it is like fair enough if you're not doing all this stuff and you're happy about it and you and you and you, you're gonna accept if your career is cut short then fair enough but i think for most people even just living healthier years being able to move freely being able to go on hikes being able to go for bike rides without pain just getting up out of bed in the morning and walking to the bathroom without having to hop along you know that's that's kind of enough for some people to to make these small adjustments to their life it's not even about being a a pro athlete but you, your body needs sure. tlc we're, we're grinding it all the time we're sitting in chairs all day you know we're spending hours in cars we're not doing things that we like we're not getting into a squat position nat- naturally throughout the day you know what i mean we're never like bending our knees to full extension and things like this yeah. so you you do need to kind of replicate those because i 
I'm a big believer of what they what they say about how we used to move back in the day. Everyone used to just oh, sit around in it. circles in a in a deep yep. squat eating and whatnot. And um I, I think I think people lived a lot longer back then, you know, just just based on how how mobile they were. Their bodies didn't shut down as as quickly. And mm-hmm. it, yeah, it goes way it goes beyond sports. I mean, but especially oh, for deep. athletes. Yeah, but especially for athletes, the amount of the amount of stress we're putting on our bodies is like insane. Like we mm. we weren't we weren't designed to yes. put our bodies through this. Like our bodies don't want it. They think our bodies treat treat it like we're under attack the whole time. That's when we get a kick in the ankle. It inflames because it's like we don't want you to even be doing. It. Oh, sorry for the noise at the minute. We just got a lawnmower no going past. But um, no the yeah, the amount of stress we're putting on our bodies just putting all our body weight in one direction, pushing off and exploding the other direction. It's basically mm-hmm. like we're in flight mode all the time. Like we're running away from a saber toothed tiger. That's what our body thinks. So <laughs> it's, yeah. it's, so you, you have to, it's, I think a lot of people think, Oh no, the body can just deal with this. I'm okay. I'm an exception to the rule, but, you, you'll find out the hard way. I have found out the hard way many times. I know you, you said yourself you've experienced overuse injuries. It's the worst feeling in the world, and they're usually the longest to get over, oh, yeah. not just physically but mentally as well because then you come back to it. And when, when you get an injury just from, like, planting and pushing in the opposite direction when there's no contact or anything, when you finally get back to playing and you have to start planting and pushing off, yeah, it, it takes a while, man. So oh, yeah. save yourself – deep levels of stress by mm-hmm. put five, 10 minutes extra into your session at the beginning to for sure to take care of yourself. No, a great couple points there. I mean, um, I like the, the, the point about, I think from a longevity standpoint, there's a difference between a health span and a lifespan. And you could also talk about that in your playing career as well. Um, you know, like you said, there, there's a difference between being able to get up and go to the bathroom and, and you know, not hobble and, 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 you know, hop to the bathroom and, and move without pain and, and enjoy the game, especially without pain. Um, and then, you know, you, you touched on it nicely moving on to – I always like to talk about the nervous system because I think it's overlooked sometimes. And, you know, mm-hmm. I love, you know, I love trying to preach like meditation. Um, I love, you know, obviously – preaching, you know, good sleep, uh, all the proper recovery methods. And like you said, I think being, I think also being able to properly cool down after a session, which also isn't sexy is very important because like you said, we're constantly in a, especially as, you know, athletes and especially guys like me and you who are, you know, always looking to progress, have kind of that more of that type A mentality, you know, we're always looking to get better. I mean, personally for me, I can talk, you know, I need to down regulate after a session mm-hmm. because we're in a sympathetic state where we're, like I said before, it's, it's, you know, we're trying to get adaptation. We want to be able where we get our gains. We always hear it is the resting state. So we want to be able to get into that parasympathetic state and recover. And I think that stuff is, is uh, super valuable, but um, I also wanted to go, go on this because I think it's super impressive. Like, one of the reasons besides your your awesome content you know like i really i love like when you signed in the usl man i, I loved it man like appreciate bro, it, man. like you know you know 30 years old people would be like oh age age so i want to talk about that you know because that's something that always comes up and that's something that i always like to talk about like for example guys like wayne rooney they were putting first he's putting first team minutes on his body at 15. yeah know? so Obviously, you know, people always want to go to that age, um, that age thing. But I like to, you know, I like the age is just a number. And especially, you know, guys like yourself and, um, you know, guys like me who like to do the extras. uh, I think we can prolong our career. So, um, you know, can you touch on that for people who, you know, might get discouraged about their age? Um, Yeah. But I think, you know, me and you preach, you know, if you do those extras, you can prolong your career. Yeah, I, I think I think what's what's been helpful for me is I know my even my early journey into football was very non-traditional. 
very non cookie cutter. I didn't follow like the classic system of getting into a team at eight, nine years old, getting into an academy. The fact that and I knew that just getting into a team at Luton Town where a lot of the other players there have been there multiple years at other academies, it just kind of showed me evidence that it doesn't always have to be the the well, you know, the well travelled route. That it doesn't always have to be that way. And everybody has their specific journey. And I've always really held on to that. And I've always known that there, there is opportunity out there. And I think as much as there are so many people pursuing to be professional athletes or top level players, there's very few actually on the course to doing it and like taking the necessary steps, doing the extras. There's a lot of people like talking and wanting and telling themselves, the same people say, oh, I want to be a millionaire, but they're not doing anything. They're still just going to a nine to five job and things like that. Okay. There's a lot of people looking wanting looking for those things. quick fixes. Everyone's Absolutely. looking for the quick fix. They're not on that long-term journey. Yeah, yeah. Oh, for sure. And and you realize that and the more you surround yourself with people wanting to be, you can really pick out those people immediately, you know, because it's usually people that don't talk about doing it that are mm -hmm. behind the scenes actually doing it you know and i found like along my path going to different countries and whatnot there's different examples of like so there is a guy who went into the pro leagues like i met a guy in the philippines he was 31 he just came over from the us he'd been a dentist for six years and um wow. he came wow. over and he finally signed a pro contract over there so i was just like when i when i hear things like that i'm like okay yeah maybe I'm not, I know I'm not going to play in the Premier League. I know, of course, miracles can happen. I'm not going to say never, say never. But like, if we're being realistic, I already always knew the route to getting there. Why would they ever take someone like me or somebody in their late 20s who has never had experience anywhere near that level when there's somebody who has evidence of competing at that level? I, I know there's a certain... There, there is a certain criteria in certain circumstances, but if you're, if you really just love the game and you're just pursuing an opportunity to make it your full time, there are so many countries out there. There are so many coaches out there with different opinions, and it really is all about just like knowing who you are, knowing that you're willing to put in the work to do it, and and that that's honestly a very hard conversation to have because there's a lot of people really not willing to actually do it but i know myself like anywhere i've ever been i've just like relentlessly always looked for somewhere to train like mm -hmm. jumping fences to break into colleges getting kicked out of security <laughs> like as long as i can get that 10 minutes in i'm like okay well can i just get one more set and stuff like that i'm like i know i'm i do whatever it takes i'm willing to go mm -hmm. near far everywhere like mm -hmm. wherever the opportunity is so i've always in enjoyed that and and for me i'm i'm a big I'm a big fan of culture. I'm a big fan of, of immersing myself in places that are really just completely different to where I grew up and things like that, because yes. I think that really helps you solidify who you are a lot more. I think once you, if you stay in the same place a lot for sure, and you're just around the same people all the time, it just kind of affirms a version of yourself, if you know what I mean. But if you're, if you're talking to new yeah. people, if you're in a brand new culture, then you really figure out who you are, what you do like, what you dislike, um, what what makes you uncomfortable, how mentally strong you are, and things like that. And mm -hmm. so, yeah, I, I believe I I believe if I just stayed in England, I probably wouldn't have pursued it any further than after Luton Town. I probably would have mm -hmm. gone to university. I would have gone to got a job and just lived a I don't want to call it a normal life, but just a, a typical lifestyle, you know, and 100%. But, and that, and that's because of the culture I would have been in, like the people I surrounded myself with, they all grew up in the same neighborhood as me. So you see a certain mm -hmm. pattern for people's lives, but the minute you get sure. up and go and, and you meet people from different walks and you realize life can just be exactly what, what you make it as long as you're willing to put yes. yourself out there, then yeah. you, you kind of you kind of ignore all the once you've lived it a non-typical life all of those 
stereotypes like, oh, this is the age you need to be before you be a exactly, pro or exactly. that and the other. Yeah. Those things don't feel real anymore. Like no, I just don't think there's any boundaries whatsoever. Yeah. I'm not saying I'm an amazing player or anything like that, but like I knew if I just stay consistent and relentless, eventually a coach will will take me for for who I am. And it's it's basically just like it's not always the best players that make it to the top level. It's the ones who just stay the course. Yeah, honestly. most persistent ones. Yeah. Think, think, think about think about water. You know, a rock wants to stop that water. Boom! It's 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 hitting it. It's hitting it, hitting it. And then you know, if eventually it erodes that rock, boom! It's through. Persistence. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it's not. It's I, not an exclusive club. Being a uh, being a professional, it's just. Um, it's just those who are just willing to just continue on and face a lot of no's and understand yeah. it's not the end every time they they it's just a it's a reroute it's not yes. a course it's, it's never the end of the road it's always just the okay this this road's not for me take a little try this mm -hmm. one try this one try this one and all of that is so much fun as well it's it's yes. tough in moments but looking exactly. back on it, it it's kind of like i always tell people i'm like the best Tell me the best movie you've ever watched. I bet the best movie you ever watched wasn't someone who just lived a normal life and like everything was great all the time. It's the movies that have like serious challenges and they rise from those challenges. They're overcoming certain things and then they're finding some success, getting knocked back. Stand like that's 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 how you want to live your life. That's what you want to look back on and and talk about. You don't want to talk about oh yeah, it was it was comfortable and it was good. At least for me, maybe some people honest, maybe some people honestly enjoy that. But if, yeah. if you if you know no. deep down that's not you, then you got to do it. You got to yeah. keep going. No, nah, dude, that's one hundred percent. So beautifully said, man. I mean, like you said, I mean, from the start, everyone has their own journey, and once you can embrace your own journey, and you can actually look yourself in the mirror, and you can say to yourself, and you can actually commit. Don't commit to, you know, friends. Don't commit to Instagram. Don't commit to pay your parents. You got to commit to yourself because it's just, it's, mm -hmm. it's you and you at the end of the day. So, and yeah. The longest relationship it's, you'll ever have. Exactly. <laughs> is, yeah. is no, it, it's yeah. so, so beautifully said, man, because, you know, um, you just, like, when you're chasing something, you know, whatever it is, whether you want to be a professional football or whatever you want to chase, when you're chasing yeah. that dream, Everyone always says, you know, um, I, I think the process is the most beautiful part, that chase. That's when you learn, you know, that yeah. chase, the highs, the lows. And there are a lot of lows. But like you said, like in the moment, it's tough. But when you look back on it, you look back at those years that you grinded and when you accomplish milestones, it just feels that much better, you know. And, and one key point that I want to pick out is football is a game of opinion. That, yeah. There might be one, coach, you know, there might be a couple coaches, you know, you go on trials, coaches see you, oh, he, you know, maybe you don't fit the system. Maybe you you um, aren't the type of player that he's looking for. But like you said, when you find that person who believes in you, you know, and, and you can express yourself on the pitch, it's just, you know, it's a different level. Yeah, man. No, you, you hit the nail on the head again. And it is, it's about remaining true to your identity. And I don't, and one thing I'm always careful with the content I put out, like I don't want to, I don't want to make it seem like being a pro is everything and that's all you should be pursuing um, because it's not. Even when you get here, it's like, it's not outside the Premier League. It's not well paid at all. None of us here in the USL are, are going to be retiring from, from our paychecks here. None of us are living a glamorous lifestyle based on what we're earning. But it is, it is just a, it's a growth it's a self development it's it's a milestone to kind of reward your your hard work you know what i mean it's kind of like a it, it goes deeper than it's hard it's really hard to put into words but i i don't want people to think like if they do, if they don't become a pro it's like you just need to be the you need to get to the as far as you can go it's like till the wheels yeah. fall off knowing you've done all you can because when you do things half heartedly it feels comfortable in the moment, but the regret after, the resentment you have for whatever you were doing, you know you didn't give it your all, it's hard to sleep mm. on that. And it's just 
that's all it really is for me is just knowing that like once i'm not able to play anymore it's just like i just did my best that's it i don't care where i played exactly. if i never became a exactly. if i never became a pro but i gave my best i would have been absolutely fine i'm mm. grateful and i'm blessed mm. that this opportunity came but for a lot of 30 year olds that ship maybe has sailed and and it's just kind of one of those things that you need to to look in the mirror just as you were saying and know like yeah all right i i i did all i could do and the the pro lifestyle isn't glamorous you know for yourself it's mm -hmm. not yeah there's a lot that's of the main reason i like to doing. have it's the main reason i wanted to start this whole thing and, and get guys like yourself on is um you know, we see on Instagram, we see the Rolexes, the Ferraris with the big players. Yeah. And I want to give, I want to give, you know, guys and girls a reality check, but I also want to show them how much you can learn through football, man. I mean, yeah. look at yeah. yourself, look at yourself, look at, look at Matt, man. Like the businesses that you guys have built through the hard work, man. And it's, 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 it's all the same stuff, you know? Yeah. And, and that's, that's why I, I love business so much. And I'm sure you do as well. It's like, it's the same as trying to build your tech technical base. It's the same as trying to build your body. It's consistency, good habits, and you know, not looking for that quick fix, that six pack ab right away, or yeah. that one million over time. That consistency and Percy for me, like you know, when I left school, I had so many people saying, "Why are you doing it?" And I look back up now, and it's like. You know, I'm so grateful I did it because you can't learn this stuff in the classroom. You know, like you said, you're meeting new people. You you yeah. and part of the beauty of football also is you make you make you know new friendships, create new relationships, and and you have the ability to communicate with people, and that's everything. Creating creating a proper network, you know, not just a network to get things, a, a proper network to develop yourself, you know. And and I think football is more, like you said, than Yes, you know, it's it's what we love to do, but you also have that self-development aspect if you look at it that way. And, you know, there are guys who, like you said, if you if you don't sign a professional contract, the, like you said, at the end of the day, you want to look back and have no regrets. But even yeah. if you didn't sign the contract, you've built those habits, the training, the discipline, all that yeah. stuff you've built. Yeah, and that doesn't go away. That that's with you for life, you know. But exactly. you're absolutely right. People, a lot of people look at those. They want those immediate circumstance changes. They want their car to change, their watch to change. But if if you pour into it and you you stick through it, your your whole life will change as a result. You become so much more resilient in every situation, and you do become a little bit more more bulletproof. Because as I think. What's unique yes. about being an athlete when when you're pursuing being a professional, unlike other jobs, which um, there's a certain skill set that might be required for the job and you, you, you can't get too hurt if you're slightly different. But when you're an athlete, they're judging you and offering you a job or rejecting you based upon kind of you, you know, what you can do as an athlete, as a person, like, it's judged on you. So when you're rejected, it's it's feels so much more personal you know when um yeah, yeah. if you let it at least yeah. but again you said it perfectly as well as the game it's a game of opinions one coach might think the world of you one coach just has absolutely no use for you it's hard to hear but this is just life this is relationships like it's like dating you're not going to marry every person you date right not ever okay. one might not go past the first date one might you'll be with them mm -hmm. for life it's not doesn't mean you're bad it just means it wasn't a good fit and um mm -hmm. there's so many life lessons to take away resilience you know not giving up when things get hard knowing that mm -hmm. better, better things are coming mm -hmm. all of that is patience sure. consistency doesn't matter what you're doing all of these things are going to make you successful at whatever that is so 100 yeah man yeah man just to follow along with that let's just you know if you could just let's finish off a little bit of your your journey sure. uh, i don't want to keep you too long but yeah if you could no, just no, you know no. how, how it how things panned out after you earned that all-american award uh yeah so from, just after i got the all-american award my college coach made a call to the coach of the rochester rhinos which was a usl championship 
team and just saying, can Michael come in and train, get some experience? I used all four years of my playing eligibility, so I was able to go and train. I still had another semester of college to do. So the coach was like, yeah, sure, no problem. So I went in and trained. And we were talking about the potential of maybe me, you know, coming on as uh, either just a training player or maybe even signing, maybe not getting many minutes, but just being amongst the team. And But basically, I had to make a decision. He didn't want me to go back to school for another semester. He's like, you're either going to be with us or or not, you know, and, and it's mm-hmm. a tough decision to make. And there was a lot of players in that team at the time who had left college. I know a lot of players do, even Matt did. And it was a great decision for them, but I wasn't ready to do that at the time. You know, I, I'd sacrificed a lot to just be at college and I wanted my I wanted my degree. I wasn't sure I was mm-hmm. going to use it. I didn't do YouTube or anything at the time. I knew about the salaries in the USL and I knew it would be very tough to live off that. And unfortunately for a lot of players, I mean, when I give Matt as an example, you know, he didn't finish his degree. We, we chatted about this, but he's got a really successful business now. So when he does eventually retire from playing, it's fine. Life goes on. You know what I mean? He might play for fun, but not much changes in terms of like, he can still pay his bills and everything like that. But a lot of players have to sacrifice so much and they get to the end of their careers and I'm going off on a tangent here, but they, no, they have, basically have to start, start off afresh all over again. You know what I mean? Don't have degrees. So maybe get like an assistant coaching job, but even coaching jobs, there's less of those than playing positions because you only have two or three coaches per team, you know? So mm-hmm. I kind of thought ahead a little bit. I had some good people around me. I did actually consider quitting at one point, but mm-hmm. um, I had my now wife. She was with me, her family I was very close with. So it kind of guided me and convinced me I should, you know, That's stay awesome. and just finish my degree because you never know what happens in, in football. You might get a terrible injury jobs are very hard to come by so I finished my degree so I didn't end up staying with the rhinos but during that time I kind of did a similar process to what I did to come out to the US I got my highlight tape from all my college highlights and PDL highlights and I just Mm -hmm. started sending them to coaches all around the world (laughs) when on Wikipedia I would would soccer way yeah yeah or everything (laughs) I tried every avenue I would just go I would type in like german football pyramid and i'd say okay there's like four or five tiers i'd click on every team and if i could find any email on the website even if it was just like a ticket office email i'd just send out like can you forward this to somebody who who can consider and i'm telling you that summer i must have sent i'm not even exaggerating maybe 600 emails and i from those 600 emails i got four genuine offers four There was one in the Philippines, two in Australia, and there was one in Austria. So Uh I was like, okay, I've got two in Australia. Uh, I'm a man of odds. I'm going to go out there and try one. And if the other one, then I'll contact the other coach kind of thing. Mm -hmm. They'd already kind of told me what the contract would be. They would still need to look at me. So I felt confident about it. I just married my wife, and I was like, we're going to go for it. So we went out How old there. Were you at the time? So I would have been twenty. I think I just turned twenty-four at this time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I just turned twenty-four. So we went out there. I went to a team in Melbourne called Northcote City. They play in the second, the second tier. So it's the mm-hmm. NPL, National Premier League. Mm-hmm. And I'm on the plane. I I land. I call the the uh, the GM of the club, the guy I've been communicating with. I'm like, hey, I'm here, everything like that. And like, like, when does training start, this and that. I find out on the phone, they just signed a Greek player, centre-back. I'm not a centre-back, but I just found out when I got there that you can only have two internationals per team. And they Mm -hmm. had about seven guys on trial, internationals, and they just filled a spot. So I'm coming in now, six more guys to fill one spot. And I'm like, you are absolutely kidding me. I mean, obviously, this is why... agents can be a good route because probably they'd find out this information but mm-hmm. i decided to just go for it and i was like okay it's it's not good odds but i'm just going to give it my all thankfully it worked out i did have a backup plan because uh, another team in a less competitive um they, what do they call them do they call them provinces in australia so that they have an npl per province is it a province mm-hmm. like basically like a state 
So yeah. I was in the state of Victoria, which was like Melbourne. And I could have gone to another one that was less competitive, but almost guaranteed a spot. So I wasn't, I wasn't too worried about it, but I wanted to try here. I, I was there for about two weeks, played a couple of preseason games. And then we had a, some fitness tests, which I thankfully coming from the US was able to absolutely blitz because, you know, mm-hmm. they run in the US, you know what I mean? In yeah. England and Australia, not so much. So yeah. I looked like an absolute gazelle, just like running around <laughs> and had had an okay preseason, kind of showed what I could do. I scored a goal, got a couple of assists and they ended up, ended up signing me, which I was really, really grateful for. Um, so I ended up staying in Melbourne in, in the MPL, was earning probably about 2000 a month there. Mm-hmm. So not loads of money, but enough to pay bills, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. enough to pay rent and a and little bit more, like we could just enjoy our, our time there. So that was like my ultimate goal. I wanted to play at least one season in my life where I could just survive off playing and like just mm-hmm. so that I could play more football, honestly. I, mm-hmm. I just, mm-hmm. so I didn't have to go to another job and this and that. I could just spend every day just focusing on football kind of like the college experience minus the the classes the but yeah yeah, yeah. all, all that, that nonsense oh yeah all that distraction um but no it, it was amazing and melbourne is an incredible city really suited our lifestyle because it was like the perfect balance between like england and the us a little bit more outgoing than the british but had the same sense of humor so mm-hmm. and it's melbourne itself is um it's like a melting pot so many different cultures there it's like one of the the best food capitals of the world like incredible food there coffee is on a another i want to level. visit australia so bad man. Oh, you would love it unbelievable. those guys know yeah. how to they have an amazing work-life balance i will say that like they just they know how to enjoy themselves i don't know if it's the same for every job but um most jobs you get out at noon on a friday so that you can basically start your weekend and happy hour starts yeah, yeah. at noon and so yeah. yeah they just enjoy themselves have a long weekend pretty much every every time and it's just a good way to live and we absolutely loved sure. it there i was there for six months and then it was like the midway point of the season where you could have the transfer window and um i'd heard rumors i wasn't sure i, I was playing a lot i was surprised i i think i played I'm not sure how, maybe started 11 out of 13 games like it was, it was good it was a good ratio so you know i was playing a lot getting a lot of experience but my so originally i i contacted a team in the philippines that i said was one of the four that got back to me after sending all those emails and the coach from that team contacted me and said we we have a transfer window coming up is there any chance you you're still interested and i see you're out in australia right now because i added them on facebook like sometimes I'd even add these coaches on Facebook, you know what I mean? And if they got back to me, I was like, any way I could communicate, I would take it. And um, so the transfer window was coming up and things at the club were a little shaky. They fired the coach that brought me in. They had a new coach that just came in. They were making some player changes. I didn't know what that was going to mean for my position. I didn't know if they were going to mm-hmm. transfer me or keep me. So a lot of uncertainties and I absolutely love adventure. So when the Philippines opportunity came, I was like, let's do it. So mm-hmm. we packed up, we flew to the Philippines. I was there for about a month, had a really cool experience that the Philippines is another level. So I was in Manila, which is like their main um, metropolitan mm-hmm. island. And uh, there was some English guys on the team. There was a lot of guys with Filipino passports, but from all over the world. So a lot of guys from California, you know, Mm. England, Germany, and played at good levels. So I went on a team. It was at the time it was called the Loyola Moralco Sparks. They were doing pretty mm-hmm. well, but there's the league is insane in the Philippines. So there was 10, 10 or twelve teams. The top four teams are super competitive, really good. Like some ex Bundesliga players. Mm-hmm. We had two brothers on our team, the young husbands who were at Chelsea until nineteen wow. or twenty, like in through the youth system, like played with some unreal mm-hmm. players very high level but then outside of those four teams terrible teams well, i watched a couple of games where like a second place team would play like a ninth or tenth place not even kidding it was like nine one the scores and <laughs> i saw a game that was 14 nil when top played bottom Jeez. so uh, it was like interesting and there was a guy there called louis clark who played at syracuse here in the us uh-huh. so i got to like meet him and chat with him and it was crazy this guy like 
did all right in college here, but over there he was scoring like four or five goals a game, like getting paid well. And he was like, it, it's good, but it's also like a bubble. You know what I mean? Like no other league in the world respects this league. And obviously I'm banging in loads of goals against lower league teams. Like he's on the front of like the Philippine men's health magazine. There's a mute. I can hear you now. All uh, right, perfect. Dude, I'm, you, I don't know. You can hear I, me? Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Cool. Uh, no cool. worries. Sorry, no worries, man. No. It's all good. Yes. So we were chatting about the Philippines. Yeah. Where, where did I cut out? I don't want to. Um, did I mention? So. The Syracuse guy. The Syracuse guy. Oh, yeah. So I was, the Syracuse guy was having, you know, he was having a blast there and. You know, he was he was on in like magazines, you know, paid really well and sponsored by Adidas Philippines there. You know, living like a it's like how Beckham would be living in the UK, but you know, the Philippine equivalent. So like that all became very attractive. And what a lot of players say that they're, they're like, I'll play here for a year to get my pro experience and then move on. But what I found was happening, especially a lot of the guys on my team. They end up staying out there for six, seven years because it's just so comfortable in the end. You're in in their world, you're you're wealthy, they're buying apartments and renting them out. They're, you know, they're they're setting themselves up for life. Mm -hmm. So towards the end of the month, the coach calls me and three uh, me and two other players, so three of us in total, into the office. Two other guys were international, and he just kind of came out and said, you know, so the Philippines is trying to be governed by FIFA. We want to be a legitimate professional league. So part of that requirement is we have to get rid of a couple of our transfer windows because every other FIFA league in the world has two. They like the Premier League has January and August. And these guys had like December, they had like a February one, a July one, they had one in November. Like they had they were just all over the place. They were just they could just basically sign players whenever. And they said and he said so basically we're getting rid of this transfer window it's not my control but we can't sign you right now but what we can do is we can keep you here you can train we can't pay you but it's cheap enough that you can kind of dip into your savings and and remain here and then hopefully the next transfer window will go through so it was about a three month wait on no guarantee whatsoever not being paid just training and so at, at the time, again, wasn't doing YouTube or anything like that. Didn't have other sources of income, so I wasn't sure if it was going to be a a good situation. So I ended up going back to England at this point because I didn't have any other options. So I was like, me and my wife went back there and uh, stayed with my my parents. I joined like a non league team just for the time being to kind of figure it out, and it just kind of seemed like everything was coming to a, to a stop in my, my journey. I didn't have any leads for teams or anything like that. So I'm like, maybe it's just time to, maybe this is it for me now. Maybe I've done all I can do. So I actually went for a job interview. I, I applied at a bunch of different jobs, got an interview at HSBC bank and um, end up getting the job. So wow. we were like, okay, but there was one stipulation. This was October that I wasn't going to be able to start until like mid November because they had to do a bunch of background checks and um, a lot of different things. The, the start date was pushed back. So I had about six weeks to do nothing basically. Mm -hmm. So what we said was me and my wife were like, we'll go back to the U S kind of maybe just go say bye to people, let people know what we're doing and just kind of enjoy these six weeks as like a vacation, go see Becca's family. Cause we've been away for, for at this point nearly going on 10 months you know so we're just like we'll go visit so i get over there and as i get there i end up getting a, a tryout opportunity with pittsburgh riverhounds because the coach of pittsburgh was the rochester rhinos coach he moved teams bob lilly oh, so yeah. i got in touch with him and he's like yeah we'll, we'll bring you in and, and we'll look at you and um so i went for a tryout things were going great got invited back the next day like it was really on fire and I was like oh maybe this is going to work out and um it was like we were playing like a, a match at the end of the session and it was like the last maybe last minute there was a player in front of me um, on my own team he got hit in the back by another player and he like speared head first into the side of my knee and my knee like popped inside and I felt a pop, but you know, when you have all the adrenaline, it was very cold because it was like winter there now. So like didn't feel any pains, but I was like, it just feels a little bit weird. 
So I hobbled off and the physio was like, no, I think you're okay. I think you're okay. You seem all right. Everything seems firm enough. Mm. And then, um, then as soon as I sat down for a minute, it just like really swelled up. And then I went to get up and it was like really lax my knee. Like I, I felt like I could push the side of my knee and it would have just kept going to the inside. And the physio was like, oh yeah, like, okay, there's, there's some, there's some damage here. Mm. So the worst thing I could have possibly done, but I got in the car after and we drove back to New York from Pittsburgh and we were going to Albany. So it was about a six to seven hour drive. And obviously I'm sitting in a car, should be elevating and icing and stuff like that. And I get back and uh, I can't even walk. And I'm looking down, it's black and blue. And I get up the next day again, it's even bigger. And I know I've done something. So come to find out, I tear my MCL. So the inside ligament of your knee just snapped. Mm. And um, it was it was so weird because like there was just so much give in my knee. It was just like there was no ligament there. Mm. And um, so basically I was stuck. We, we were just at my, my wife's parents. I couldn't walk and do anything, wasn't able to fly at the time. I didn't have health insurance, so I couldn't get it like properly checked out or, mm. or anything. But I knew the MCL just by like doing my own research and chatting to an old physio who worked at one of my previous teams. They said, you don't need surgery for an MCL. It's like one, one of the few ligaments that if you damage, it's, it's pretty easy to heal because your, your knee is still straight so it can inhale but if it's in the center of the knee there acl one of that all needs surgical repair so i basically just had to play a waiting game and i was out for a good three months before i could start drugging again and obviously i missed the window to go back to work at hbc i just stayed out there and so me and my wife ended up we just moved back to rochester which was where i went to college just because we knew the area we had a lot of friends there we found a really cheap apartment I didn't even have my green card at this time, so I couldn't work. Uh, still kind of getting back from my injury, so getting back into drugging. So Becca, Becca was working there, and I was doing a little bit of like coaching on the side, getting ca- cash under the table. And um, then it just so happened um, a coach I used to know was starting an MPSL team in Rochester. So I kind of had this opportunity to come back and play again. So I kind of got myself back healthy um started playing for the team was applying for my green card so couldn't work during this time so i needed stuff to just keep me busy and that's pretty much when i started my youtube Mm. i had the youtube youtube channel but i was kind of documenting me my training sessions because i was doing a lot of individual training the mpsl team only trained once or maybe twice a week so i was just kind of shooting some videos and putting them out there and it was just really really strange how quickly um, it kind of took off because I had a channel that had about mm. 3000 subscribers way back when, from when I was at the Nike Academy and things like that. But it just seemed people really wanted this, this training material. And I was kind of putting it out there. I, I wanted to see my own development because I was still nursing my injury a lot. So I was filming myself sprinting a lot and it was a little bit for me, but putting it out there and then it seemed like people wanted more and more. And then maybe six months after I applied for my green card, I finally got it. So I started working at Starbucks and um, uh, I was working there and yeah, (laughs) making those coffees. And uh, it was crazy. I was in this really like wealthy neighborhood where I just didn't fit in at all. And I absolutely hated it just because you get berated if you were like half a pump shot of vanilla or, (laughs) you know, (laughs) exactly. So that was a grind, man. But it just so happened that when I played my MPL se- season, we played against Syracuse, who one of their assistant coaches was also involved with a professional indoor team. So you might be aware of it. They're the MASL here in the US, which is indoor football. So you play on like a hockey arena, six a side. It's a professional sport. You play with a normal size five football. The goals are a little oddly shaped. I've not really been aware of it too much other than there was a team in Rochester that I've watched a couple of times but never really considered it but when they were like hey do you want to come for a tryout we watched you play against Syracuse we think you could be a good indoor player Mm -hmm. and um so I was like why not at this point so I drove up there trained for a week ended up getting signed on like the smallest contract ever and so small that I still had to keep working at Starbucks and the training was an hour and 20 minutes away from where i live so every single morning 
I'd have to get up at five in the morning, drive an hour and a half. And this was in the winter and in upstate New York, insane blizzards. So I had to drive like 30, 40 miles an hour. So sometimes it'd like take two and a half hours to get there, train for an hour, drive back, go to Starbucks, do the closing shift, get back about midnight, try and edit my videos because I was doing like everyday videos, get to sleep at like two in the morning, wake up at five, go train, come and like just live in this over and over again. And sometimes I'd have gone, yeah, it's crazy. But that was like my first like pro experience in the US at all. So like I convinced myself it was a good idea. Um, it's very unhealthy. Bearing in mind, not earning much money at this point. So pretty much eating pasta twice a day with not much else and a couple of scrambled eggs and this little tiny apartment. Oh, it was a grind, man. But um, finally, YouTube got to the point where I could quit Starbucks. And that was like the that felt like an amazing day, you know, so. I was like able to kind of focus on my training, sleep a little bit more, more time for editing and uh, got a little bit healthier, got a couple of appearances for the team. And um, then I just got, I got the bug again to go play. So I was like, you know what I'm going to, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back to the UK and see what I can do there or like see if there's any teams around Europe. Mm-hmm. And um, cause at this time, cause my YouTube was getting a little bit more popular. You, uh, do you know Unisport? the yeah. Danish, uh, Danish company. So they have a YouTube channel, which is pretty popular and they wanted to collab. They wanted me to come out, do a couple of my drills for them, which I thought would be amazing because their filming quality is unreal. Yeah. So I was like, if I could get a couple of videos from my channel and theirs, this would be amazing and help my channel grow. So I went back to the UK, um, for almost six months I was playing for a non-league team. There it was, it was okay. Um, we did a little bit of a European tour at the same time. And I was like making videos in different countries, seeing if I could contact any coaches, but nothing was really, nothing was really happening at the time. So after six months of just kind of making videos, building my YouTube channel, that's where I developed my first like ball mastery training program. It was a good time to really pour into YouTube in the end and take it a little bit more seriously. And then I came back to the U S so this would have been at this point, 2018, end of 2018. And I got straight back into indoor because what had happened is I came back to Rochester and the old Rochester Lancers, which was the first indoor team I ever watched, they folded for a few years, but then they came back. Mm. So I'd signed a second year with the Syracuse indoor team. So that's why I went to Europe because I knew if I came back to the US, I'm guaranteed a team. And they were going to be paying a little bit more this time because you get you get a boost in your second year. But when they when I got back, the Rochester team it came. So if, I was like, if I can avoid this one and a half hour travel every day and this and that. And it just so happened that the Syracuse team had rebranded and now they were called Utica City FC. So they technically folded the Syracuse team and created the Utica team and we're going to keep all the same players. But that means all, all of our contracts were voided. So I was able to sign with a new team. So like I just explained to the coach and he was completely understanding and I ended up playing with Rochester and they were in the second division of indoor football. So a little bit of a lower standard. I got a lot more minutes, got a lot more experience, a lot more confidence with it. And then they had an outdoor team, the NPSL team. So I played with them a second year and then I played with them again indoor, but this team, this time they bumped up to the first division. We had a good year and the owner put in some money and we got into the first division and we ended up playing against like the team I used to play for. I captained the team at this point. So I was a little bit more experienced, a little bit more comfortable playing most games, picked up a cup, picked up an injury in my groin that season, which kept me out a little bit, but overall it was pretty decent. But then that that's actually when COVID hit. So this was um, 2020 at this point. So we, we cut our season short by about a month. And then 2020, I just didn't play at all. I was just individual training um mpsl team didn't um didn't go ahead the mpl season itself was cancelled no teams playing the only league that was playing was was the usl and i didn't have any contacts in the usl at this point um so i just trained i just trained tried to get myself healthy i healed up the groin injury that i kind of got in the season so i took a little bit of time with that and then I was kind of stepping away from football at this point, to be honest with you, and just kind of focusing on YouTube and my brand because I was like, this is kind of what's bringing me success at the minute. I was like, I might as well, I might as well go deeper into this. I'm really enjoying it. 
um, seems to be helping out a lot of people. It seemed very rewarding. And then my wife and I, we took a trip to California to train with your boy, Sam, um, yeah. a technique trainer. So I was, I was training with him down there and so random out of the blue, my phone's ringing from a, a Canadian number. And I'm like, what the heck? So I think it's a, I thought it was a spam call. So I ignore the first one, but then they call back. I pick it up and it's an agency, OPSM. And wow. they just said, Hey, Michael, my name, it was a guy called Jeff and his brother was him. They co own the company. He played in the USL and he was like, Hey, man, I'd, I'd follow you on Instagram and YouTube. I see you're not playing right now, but I've been following for a while. I'm just wondering what your your plans are. Like, are you planning on continuing to play? Is it just because of COVID? You haven't found a team? What's going on? Have you decided to retire? And I just said, you know, like it was kind of circumstantial. Didn't have a team to play on this year. I'm just kind of focusing on my YouTube, still training every day, but not not playing with a team. Uh-huh. And he said, you know, um, if you're if you're want if you want to get back into indoor, we we probably have some opportunities for you because we identified you as a profile and even considering your age and everything this year with COVID there's less international players coming in because they can't travel. So a lot of USL, USL one, NISA teams have spots on their roster and like, this could be a perfect time. So like given your like age, isn't going to be a factor. Lack of experience isn't going to be a factor. If you go to these trials and you do well, they're going to pick you up. So it's a, a great opportunity. So I was like, you know what? Like, I have nothing to lose by signing with you guys. Like, if you can find an opportunity, great. And if you don't, I just continue doing what I'm doing at this point. So they were pretty quick moving with it. I signed, I, we didn't officially sign, but they were like, are you agreeing to work with us? We made a verbal commitment and I was going to sign when I would see them later on. Um, but they were like, we can get you in the door in a NISA club straight away because they're looking for players and they're looking for a winger. We think you'd do well. Literally the following weekend, I was up in Michigan training with a team up there. They had a German coach who used mm-hmm. to be a Bundesliga player, um, very wealthy owner who was pretty driven. You know, he's building a stadium, trying to get into the USL at some point, um, had his own training center, which was amazing. This big indoor facility, state of the art. So, okay, this could be good. Um the only thing that w- it was a little bit hesitant was that, like the living quarters were so poor, like really, really bad. They basically took a old office building and converted it into some bedrooms. And at the time, you know, my my wife w- was with me. I was like, well, she can't come live in here because I was like rooming with another guy, and um, so. the pay was okay, like, but it just seemed like not. It just 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 something didn't feel quite right about it. And what yeah. really kind of d- deterred me is throughout that one year of 2020 they had rostered like i think it was like 50 or 60 players at one yeah. point and there'd been a high turnover rate so i'm like there's a reason either guys are getting just cut or they're getting they're leaving on their own accord but something's not right here and I was yeah, like, I so I, a lot of guys in and out of the door in, yeah yeah and uh as you know, Nisa is a very new league. At that time, that was only the second year of operations. So a lot of these teams were in MPSL previously, and then they're, they're, they're going to go pro. So they're all in a transition phase, learning how to pay players, raise money, um, aren't, aren't fully equipped to house players. And, you know, it was every day is like, six guys jumping in a five-seater car like convoying to training and it was just just i was talking to jeff and he was like i was like i will sign here if there's no other option because i want to get my foot in the door you know i'm not gonna like think i'm too good for any team because at this point you know i've not been in the pro outdoor team in the us and uh you know i chat to my my wife and it's close enough to rochester where we could make it work and i could she could stay there i could be here but we could still see each other often and so we were willing to make it work, but Jeff was like, there will be other opportunities, but like, let's keep this as a backup. And then in November of that year, mm. OPSM had a combine. So it was basically like a showcase for all unsigned players. And it was here in Tulsa. So mm. it was a two day event, came down for a weekend, basically just played three games in total. 
in front of a variety of coaches, USL, NISA, MPSL, you name it. There was just so many coaches here, so many players. And I ended up having a good combine. So I, I really prepared for it, came in, just kind of didn't play with any fear, you know, just like nothing to lose mentality. I'm like, just go for it kind of thing. So did very well. And it ended up that the FC Tulsa coach was impressed. He was there anyway. It wasn't like he was really coming down to scout players. He he kind of, he knew the agency because they provided him with players before. So they were kind of friends. He was there to just kind of hang out with them. But it, apparently he identified me as a player. We chatted after very briefly. He's like, we'll, we'll be in touch kind of thing. And I was like, okay what are the chances of me getting signed to a usl championship team you know like no experience not played usl one not played nisa just played indoor so i was like okay i appreciate it but i doubt it's going to happen and even our conversations going forward with the agency was like we were looking for a usl one club mm -hmm. and there was a couple of teams interested it's getting closer and closer to pre-season so it passed christmas january had passed it was getting into february now I knew preseason was starting in March. They finally got it released that they could start training. And it literally got to the week before preseason of the USL. And we hadn't got a team yet. And I thought I was going up to Madison in Wisconsin. Yeah. That was like the, the last I'd heard. And they were like, we're just going to make a couple more calls and make sure I'm like, what happened with um, Tulsa? And they were like, well, they're not sure. COVID's a challenge right now. They're not really accepting trialists. They're not ready to sign you at the minute. They don't know if they can bring guys in for preseason because they need to keep a training bubble and not have outside contamination you know and all this and it literally got to a couple maybe three or four days before preseason and then finally i i got a call saying tulsa want to look at you in preseason you got to get out there they're not going to provide housing or anything like that you got to you got to figure it all out and um but they, they're willing to look at you. So I was like, all right, let's do it. So I just went down there, got in a hotel, had to quarantine for a few days. I didn't know this at the time. So I'm like basically just chilling in my hotel and then getting a couple of hours to go out to the pitch. It's funny because I was I went and trained at the same place Tulsa trained, but kind of from afar. So I was on a pitch really far away. So I could see them training in the distance, but couldn't make contact. Really weird. And um, then I finally get in. I uh, was feeling really good, had a had a decent start to preseason. And then we went on a trip to Texas where we played three preseason games and did did well, feeling fit. And then literally the day before, um, so like preseason was ending, I played all the way through preseason and I'm waiting to hear what I'm doing. It was a Sunday evening. That was the last day of my hotel. I didn't know I was going back to New York. And there was phone calls going back and forth. I went and I remember just going and sitting in the park um, near here and just kind of like waiting. Like I knew all these conversations were happening. I'm kind of talking to my wife, talking to my agent. Mm -hmm. I'm not talking to the coach at all, but like I'm getting secondhand information on what he's saying. And I'm waiting there for like three hours. It's all going back and forth. And then finally I get the call and it's like, okay, they, they want to sign you. They're, they're ready to do it. They, they like what they saw. They like you bring a different identity to the team. You're a little bit more raw, they noticed, but they kind of like that. Um, mm -hmm. They they told me from the get-go, you know, I wouldn't be a starting player, um, that I'd probably be someone that adds depth, comes off the bench now and again, need a bit of fine-tuning, but they like they like what they saw enough to, to offer me a spot on the roster. So was, uh, I was basically faced with the decision, do I stay here where I probably won't play much, or do I go to a USL one club where I might play a little bit more? And I always think back to the uh, goldfish analogy. I'm like, you, you really, you grow in your environment. You know what I mean? So if, if your environment's small, you stay small kind of thing. And I knew at this point, I was always feeling a little bit of regret of staying in Rochester so long, playing NPSL for, for two straight seasons. I feel like I should have pushed on a little bit more. And I was getting very comfortable, you know, getting the captain's armband, playing well, scoring goals. You feel good, right? So it was... It was groom, groom my ego a little bit, but so I was just like, you know what? I just need to give myself the biggest challenge. I'm going. I'm turning thirty this year. I can't look back and say you played where like it was going to be a cushy, good opportunity. Like if you really want to get to the end of your career, knowing you gave it all, you got to go for the biggest challenge. Even if you're the worst player there and you get embarrassed every day and you get exposed, that's only going to help you more than going somewhere where like 
you don't even need to turn it on and you can kind of perform well. So I was like, let's do it. So I came in with the boys and yeah, man, been been here ever ever since. And awesome. like I've had it, I've had only one appearance at this point in the regular season. Came in with a bit of a groin injury that I got during the end of my last preseason game. I I felt something go in my groin, just like a little twinge. But at this point, I wasn't signed, so I didn't ask for a sub. And I, I knew in the moment, I, like every time I like got into a sprint, I was like, I'm making it worse every time. But I don't want to be the guy that's like, Hey, coach, can I get a sub? Um, we literally played three games in the space of like five days and the last two games were less than 48 hours apart and I played 70 minutes in the second to last game then I played the full 90 in the last game so my body was just absolutely done it was like 90 plus degree heat and basically just like the worst possible recipe for getting an overuse injury unfortunately so I came in hurt a bit so I had to rehab my groin finally got that good made my first appearance and I was getting in the squad, like in the 18, not starting or anything, and but just getting in the squad. And then I got my knee injury, so that knocked me back for a couple of weeks. Then got back to fitness, got in the squad a couple of more times. And then a few weeks ago, I got my ankle injury. And it's tough, man, because I know I'm, I'm in the bottom percent of players here in terms of like effective on the pitch at this point, because these guys there's a lot of guys in the team have played on national teams played in the mls and i'm growing so much alongside them and they're playing really well and i know to to even get a chance on the field i need to be firing on all cylinders but i i I still believe it's the right place for me i think even just training here every day i'm going to be a much better player than if i went to a nisa club and playing every game just because the intensity levels of the training sessions sometimes they feel more intense than the games like guys are going so hard on each other i mean no coincidence why i picked up these kind of collision injuries just guys going in like they're on their worst enemy but that's but then we're all friends after they're just so intense and guys are fighting for a spot in the team and that's the thing with the usl a lot of guys who use the usl as a platform they want to push on higher you know what i mean they want to get in the mls they want to go to europe so they're not messing about when it comes to training and it's great it's 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 a grind training in this especially right now and thick of the summer i'm looking forward to september october it's a little cooler um we've got a lot of games coming up so hopefully i'll be able to get involved but just blessed that i even got a a usl appearance i didn't think that was going to be you know part of my journey but Mm. as you as my story is the example it's it's unpredictable man there's no there's no there's no one way to do it there's no there's no step-by-step process. And that's the hardest question to answer. That, and probably the, the question I get the most is like, how do you become a pro? And it's like, honestly, I don't know how I become a pro, really. I don't know how. I, I, I couldn't have predicted There's no formula. Yeah, there's no formula. It, and the more time I spend with each of the players on this team on the away trips and stuff, everybody's journey is like podcast worthy. You know what I mean? It's like unbelievable. Some of the things they've gone through, guys literally yeah. like, abandoning their countries coming here illegally just to find an opportunity with like a couple of dollars in their wallet and i'm like wow when 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 i see how like i hate the word desperate but that's that's kind of like just so just yeah. all or nothing you know what i mean just leave families behind they bring the training you know that's that hunger they yeah. bring to training every single day and yep yep you know i've seen the same thing man people they they, they sleep outside they it's just, it's, it's, and I, I, you know, first of all, fantastic journey, massive respect, you know, Appreciate to you it, and the way you keep going, man. And dude, the, the, the injury scene is not, not an easy one, but you know how to deal with it, man. You, like yeah. you said, you of course, you keep going and you're just improving. So massive respect, yeah. man. And, uh, I'm sure every single person listening to this got, got a lot out of it. And then big thing, you know, that I like about you that I like about Matt and that I try to embody with myself is like, I don't, I don't want to just put out content to put out content. I want to, I'm here to live it, you know? And, um, it's something like that I had struggled with in the past. Like, you know, I, I I tried to get into the, the vlogging part and this and that and showing my journey as well. But then sometimes you like lose sight, you know? And then when you start to lose sight, it's like, what's going on? You know, we're a footballer at the end of the day. So it's like, yeah, man, I mean, uh, 
like I said, massive respect and I uh, appreciate yeah. you coming on, man. Um, yeah, no, it's interesting you say that. I, I think, to be honest with you, vlogging is my least least favorite content to make. Oh, I hate it. And um, I, 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 yeah, I, in a way, I feel a bit of a responsi responsibility to my audience to update them. But I tell you, man, it's very hard to to get hyped for it, especially when you're in the middle of a grind or injury and when you're feeling like so like you really need to use all your might to stay mentally healthy yes any little bit of extra stress or anything like that and it's just like it's hard man because you, you don't want to be on the camera or like doom and gloom and like another injury and this and that and the other but I, I i have a lot of respect for matt honestly like that guy can pick up the camera no matter how he's how he's feeling yeah. and he can share he can be raw if I'm feeling down, there's absolutely no way I'm I can I can do that. Like he, he's a different different breed, man, and and still performs at a crazy high level. It's not a distraction for him. Um, great guy as well, you know, like top professional. Um, but he he can show it, man, and maybe you know he's more experienced pro than I am. So maybe that's something to do with it. But like I'm still I'm still feel so fresh in my journey because every every opportunity I've had, it's like kind of always short segments you know what i mean it's a lot a lot of different things and i'm still processing it so trying to like share that with others and give advice and things like that i'm like i'm still i still feel like a a baby learning all of this and like maybe one day i'll be able to package all this information and and uh regurgitate it to you but at this moment i'm like i feel so frazzled all the time and i, I love it and I'm, I'm sharing everything i can and um yeah but it's definitely not my my favorite content to make but mm -hmm. sometimes it's the most valuable at the same time so i know i know i know it's got to be done sometimes and yeah. i've learned a lot one thing i've learned through football is like you don't you don't only do stuff when you feel like doing it you know what i mean like you don't only train when you feel like it you don't That's pick up the nice. phone and call a coach when you feel like it you got to do a lot of stuff that you don't feel like doing so this is just another one of those things and 100 percent yeah, no, and, 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 yeah, it's the same exact thing I said to Matt when I had him on. My favorite video of his is when he like when he really got emotional and vulnerable about his injury. Like, dude, no, like yeah. I said, Matt, I no chance I would ever be able to do that. And like, massive respect. And I'm the same way, man. Like, personally, for me, I hate vlogging because I always i try to like live in the present and also it feels like it becomes a distraction for me and like you said yeah you know, that's a different but uh <laughs> you know, like we said yeah. th there's there's different things for everyone everyone's got their own way um but yeah, yeah man, if you're, that's it you're three of you know you you've dropped some you've dropped some gold man but if you could just leave us with two to three of your best piece of advice where you're at now, 30 USL championship player and all your experience and your journey. Um, you could sum it up. I know it's not easy. Yeah, no, it's not easy, but consistency over everything. That's the cliche one. I'll get it out of the way with, but like the daily habits all add up. Like you wouldn't believe it. Like nothing, nothing one, not one big thing is going to take you to, another level it's just being consistent every day even when there's no opportunity in sight and that's the thing that's always lived that's always lived with me even when i've had no team opportunity or anything like that i just still stay true to my training every day because you never know when an can, opportunity pops up. yeah you you never know and usually when the opportunities come it's like next week and i'm like there's no way if I started from zero now, I'm getting ready for that. You know what I mean? But I'm always like, that's fine because that, that's what I've been preparing for. I didn't know it was coming, but I knew it was coming at the same time. Um, next one is just, you really got to, you really got to know who you are. You got to know who you are and be honest with yourself. Know, are you willing to work for it? Because don't start if you're not, because it's just going to, it's going to be, it's already a massive uphill battle. And you're just going to make it so much more impossible for yourself. Like, be realistic with your goals, not realistic in the way that like you can't achieve it. Because I believe everyone can, but are you willing to do the things to achieve it? And I think that's the the biggest differential between the two. Like, a lot of people have the ability, and it's not a case of can you do it, but are you willing to to be a professional? Are you willing to go to bed 
at 10 at night and get your eight hours of sleep? Are you willing to stop eating chocolate? That's a mass. That was a really hard one for me. You know what I mean? Like to, I got a huge sweet tooth, you know, and things like that. I, are you willing to be disciplined with your diet? Are you willing to do the stretching, the foam rolling and all those little details and spend your entire day basically priming your body exactly. in a way and, and being mentally strong enough that when those dips and stuff happen, that you're still so true to yourself that like, you know, it's just a part of the journey, rejection, yeah. failure, injuries. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they speak a lot louder than the successful moments, but it's all part and part of the parcel. So you got to just, you got to just stick the course, man. You really do. 1000% man. And just to add on that, man, I, I, I remember, um, you know, in the beginning of the conversation when you said just how, how hard of a job being a professional footballer is or the chase to be a professional footballer. And you just said it right there, man. It's a 24-7 job. And, and until you accept that, you know, like you said, and also we want to add, you know, at that, at, this, at that level, it's like, you know, you're only as good as your last performance. You got to perform every day of training, be mentally switched on. Physically, you got to be there. So it's it's not easy. It's not easy. But as you've seen with Michael, I mean, you know, if, if you stay the course, you persist, good things happen. So, man, thanks yeah. again uh, hey. for coming on. Uh, I appreciate it. We, we definitely got a link sometime in the future. Yeah, I need to hear your story, man. I know there's a lot. There's a yeah, lot yeah. of stories you have for me as well. So I'll look forward to that. For sure, man. Appreciate you having me on, Rick. Yeah, awesome. man. Stay healthy and, and best of luck with, with those injuries. And uh, we'll chat, man. Yeah, thank you, brother. All right, brother. Have, have Take a good care of yourself. Yeah, you Seven. too. See ya. See ya, bro.